thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shreyas. Uh, thank you, Shruti, for uh, burdening me with this uh, uh, activity. Um, and thank you all for uh, for coming. Um, it's really amazing that so many of you have showed up uh, this morning. Um, and of course, uh, I'm very glad to be back in Washington in general, because I started my professional life here at the World Bank in 1976. And I've been here different times after that as well. So it's basically home for me. So uh, this uh, talk is going to be rather self-indulgent. I hardly ever get a chance to do that, but I'm going to do it today. Uh, and that's why the talk is called How the Karma and Control National Policy of India was Dismantled, a personalized narrative from the trenches. Um, so uh, I see uh, very few Indian faces here, so it's terrific, because then you won't know much about what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> um, so for those of us in India, beyond the age of 50, India has been transformed beyond what we might have dreamt of uh, before the 1990s. In real terms, the Indian economy has is now about six times the size it was in 1991. Uh, however, during the, over the same period, the Chinese economy has grown 15 times at this, over the same period. Um, the image of India and its own self-image has changed from one of a poverty-ridden slow-growing, closed economy to that of a fast-growing, open, dynamic one. And these days, of course, we are very proud to say that we are the fastest growing major economy in the world. And the G20 this year gave us a platform on which to blow our trumpet, uh, which we did, of course. Um, though much of the policy focus has been on the economy, change has permeated almost all aspects of life in India. Um, we also engage with the world on a different plane, as exemplified, what I just mentioned, by our demonstrated uh, leadership of the G20 this year. And of course, with the acquisition of nuclear capability in the late 1990s, um, our approach to defense and security and foreign policy has also undergone great transformation. So in this talk, I focus on how it all started. That is the reforms process, the genesis and implementation of 1991 industrial policy reforms, which is only part, there's one part of the whole reform process. Um, and that really constituted uh, the transformational break with the long-standing command and control in Indian economic policy stance since independence which you can sort of encapsulate it in a few lines here on the screen. Um, so I had the privilege, as Shreya said, of being associated with the overall process of economic reforms, not just any policy reforms, from 1988 till 2015, uh, which is when I finally left the government. Um, but most closely, of course, with the industrial policy reforms of 1991, um, Although this was only, as I said, uh, one segment of the overall reforms that have taken place sort of on a continuous basis in the early 1990s, it was symbolic that who first industrial policy reforms of the mindset change that took place in the country. Um, now, there were many accounts of the 1991 reforms uh, by a number of different people. Uh, many of them have been top-down views, people who were there and not here where I was. So uh, today I'm giving what I think is a workmanlike technocratic view of how these reforms were initiated and implemented in 1991. Um, and uh, the question, in you know, some first question really is, since uh, these reforms, 1991 initiated reforms, were a clear break from the direction followed in the previous 40 years uh, since independence, 45 years, 44 years, how could such reform take place? That's, to my mind, the interesting question. Um, and what is also important is that unlike the uh, huge ideological break uh, 
as exemplified by Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan here, uh, which led to what some would characterize as market fundamentalism in the world since the 1980s, uh, or the market-oriented Big Bang lurch of hitherto socialist countries in Eastern Europe and Russia after the fall of Soviet Union in 1990. In India, it was the same Congress party in 1990 that had presided over the central planning dominated import substituting license permit Raj earlier, uh, which ushered in the new India 1991. Moreover, and this is also very interesting, the progenitors, the key progenitors of 1991 reforms were a trio of self-effacing leaders. Prime Minister Narasim Rao was always known to be colorless, and he always remained colorless. Um, but he provided really savvy political leadership. Um, Finance Minister Manmohan Singh um, provided the intellectual and technocratic heft and you know he's also very very self-effacing, and principal and even the most self-effacing principal secretary of the prime minister Amarnath Varma was the indispensable bureaucratic enforcer of the reforms. How the for five years, ninety one to ninety six, how the reforms took place. Um, Shruti and Shreyas have put together lots of photographs which I have never seen, uh, but they could hardly find any photograph of A and Varma. I think you found what one photograph of A and Varma, which is incredible actually. So what happened? After the 1980s, the, the 1980s were characterized by various economic excesses, particularly fiscal. Um, we had a standard, what you might call dual balance of payments and fiscal crises, which built up in India for some years before 1991. But towards the late 80s, uh, the political instability was such that no big decisions could take place. So by June 1991, the economic situation was dire. Inflation was well into double digits. I think from 16.9, I think was the peak. And foreign exchange reserves were at rock bottom, not more than two weeks equivalent of imports. Uh, the IMF and World Bank pressure was undeniable. Uh, and one of the questions is how important was the IMF and World Bank pressure on the reforms? Um, so, uh, um, it, 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 a lot of things, it, 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 there was IMF and World Bank pressure, but, um, you know, uh, there had been another IMF program, 1981-82, just after the 1979 oil price shock. And that had not resulted in any similar well-organized reform program. So in that sense, yes, of course, there was pressure. Yeah. But I think that it succeeded in, 19, in the 1990s because there was emerging technocratic consensus in India on the direction of reforms over the previous decade or so, 1980s. And a great deal of work had been done towards liberalization within different arms of the economic policy establishment in the 1980s. So in some sense, the, <laughs> the country was ready and the good part of the reform program was indeed homegrown. <laughs> and now focus on Industrial, so I'll not, I'll not focus on industrial policy from 1991 as an illustration of the domestic generation of the world economic process. These reforms are somewhat different um, from the other reforms because they were carried out in one shot on July 24, 1991, less than five weeks after the new government came into power with Narasim Rao as the prime minister. Most other reforms, or big reforms over time, fiscal trade, monetary, financial sector, policy reforms, and infrastructure, and so on, were carried out bit by bit over the next few couple of decades. So let me now be a bit self-indulgent um, and tell a little bit about my personal journey. First, I, as I said, I started my professional life after my PhD at Princeton, uh, here at the World Bank. And I was, uh, I was like this, blinkers. I was only interested in urban economics, urban development. And I won't go into a long story, but I went back to India in 1980 after having spent half my life abroad, that is 16 years at that time, to work on urban development in the Indian Planning Commission. I worked exclusively on housing and urban development for three years before returning to World Bank after my leave finished. My main work at that time involved running 
four task forces on planning, financing, and management of urban development, and on housing and shelter for the urban poor. These reports did arouse a lot of interest among the cognoscenti of urban development, but did not catch the attention of anyone else, uh, especially mainstream policymakers. So I returned to the World Bank after these three years. I also concluded for myself that the time was not ripe for policy work in urban development in India. It's not clear, but it's still ripe for that. That's 40 years later. Uh, and those of you who have been to India will know what our cities look like. So uh, especially the, media, the smaller cities are even worse than the big cities you would visit. So it's still not clear uh, that the time is ripe. Basically, what I felt was that there were too many moving parts in the system between the central, state, and city governments, and basically too few policy instruments at the central level to be effective. And this is a big problem that uh, every in every country, the central government or the union government, or the federal government, doesn't have that many levers to do something about the cities. So it has to be decentralized. Therefore, it is massive, that much more difficult. So anyway, I therefore decided to ditch urban development, which had worked on for 14 years and done nothing else uh, by 1988 or so, and retrain myself uh, on mainstream policy areas such as industrial trade and macro policy. At the World Bank, uh, when I returned, I worked in the Philippines during the transition from President Marcos to President Aquino. Now, of course, a Marcos is back uh, <laughs> almost 40 years later as the president. Um, when the IMF and the World Bank designed macro stabilization and industrial uh, and, and structural adjustment programs, and among their activities, I led a team to design industrial policy reforms in the Philippines. Um, this gave me some idea of the policy process involved in designing countrywide macroeconomic strategy, including tax reforms but particularly focused on industrial policy. For me, this is important because I'd only done urban development earlier. Um, actually, I had when I got back to the World Bank, I tried to, I was then seeing the change taking place in Southeast and East Asia. And I really wanted to become the country senior economist for the Korea division, uh, because that's what I was obviously the most fascinating. But I got picked to the post by someone else less deserving. Uh, <laughs> He wouldn't agree, of course, a good friend of mine. Um, so I got the Philippines, uh, which was not exactly the shining star of uh, economic development, policy, etc. cetera. Um, so, but then what happened is later, 19, late 1986, uh, uh, on Deputy Chairman Dr. Manmohan Singh, the Deputy Chairman Planning Commission, Dr. Manmohan Singh's invitation, I returned to the Planning Commission as economic advisor he had created a new development policy division in which he'd got three of us uh, to join as economic advisors. Uh, but unfortunately, that never really took off because partly because Dr. Manmohan Singh himself uh, um, left in, I think, mid-87 uh, mid or I think mid-87, uh, our father was no longer there. And so uh, the bureaucracy never likes new people coming in. So... Uh, we were kind of left to fend for ourselves. Uh, however, uh, with remember those of you, well, some of these names won't make much sense to you, but I'll name them anyway. It'll take too long to say who they were. But there were uh, members like Abid Hussain, who was had been a long-term civil servant, um, had been in turn, had, had, had a lot of trade policy, uh, but he had become a member of the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission had a deputy chairman who was really the head, the chairman has always been the prime minister. The deputy chairman was the head. And then you had half a dozen members in charge of different sectors. Another member was Yuginda Alag, who was in charge of agriculture and also prospective planning. And Raja Chalaya, who uh, was, had headed the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, a uh, real tax expert. Um, so these were all people who have been in India for a long, long time. Uh, and basically homegrown, although they are also perhaps studied abroad. Also advisors like what you might call now, he would hate me to say this, old-timer Nitin Desai, uh, who just turned 80 last year, and newly minted economic advisors, Arvind Birwani, myself, and Srinivas Madhur, and Jairam Ramesh, who has been later on joint politics and became a minister. So it was a fantastic 
I'm just given a few names. It's an incredibly interesting place to be in, even though I didn't have much to do uh, in the sense that Banmohan Singh had taken off. So I was then keen to then get out of there uh, to be doing something useful. But Mr. Abid Hussain, who was really one of the early liberalizers, um, constantly pushed the policy envelope in different areas. He had chaired, as a planning commission member, a committee on capital markets. This was new because the planning commission had never been interested in capital markets. Um, and this, of course, was the, was the origin of some of the capital market reforms implemented much later. Among other activities, he appointed me as what's called a member secretary, that is the guy who does all the work, on a high-level committee on restructuring the textile industry, and later in a similar capacity in a high-level committee on industrial exports. Again, the Planning Commission had never been interested in exports. So these were new things that were happening in the late 80s before the actual reforms took place. That's what I mean by homegrown and technocratic consensus taking place at that time. So from my personal point of view, both these roles put me into direct touch with industrial policy and also familiarized me with the powerful vested interests exemplified by trade unions, incumbent industrialists, and the entrenched bureaucracy. And this work also brought home to me how irrational and dysfunctional our industrial control system was, in particular the textile industry from which we are suffering till today. So when you go, to, you know, I was when I was here teaching at Yale for a number of years, I used to go to Walmart and other department stores, not to buy anything, because I don't need anything to buy. But as a tourist, I went around the store looking where things made. I never found anything made in India. Okay, it was uh, China, uh, Malaysia, Korea, Ethiopia, Mexico, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Only thing that made in India I found was towels somehow. Um, but the point is that in the 19th century and even perhaps the first half of the 20th century, India was a major textile producer, and it was because of a dysfunctional control system that we killed our textile industry. So till today we haven't recovered from that. Um, then, uh, because I was itching to get out of there, uh, to Planning Commission, um, I got a providential opportunity to become economic advisor to the Ministry of Industry, which is what Shreyas had mentioned. Um, that was 1988. And uh, initially, the head of the bureaucracy, uh, Mrs. Otima Bodia, um, that is, she was the secretary of the Ministry of Industry, even though she had hired me, didn't really seem to want me to do very much. Uh, and it's partly because the economic advisor position had been vacant for the previous three years. Uh, there was an acting person. And um, so uh, in some of the, the, the work had got diluted. And it, it, what happens in bureaucracy is it never likes a vacuum. Someone else pitches in. Um, so, uh, I, so what I did was I actually had a good time doing some research. Um, also, as I was getting a little more fed up and not doing anything uh, policy-wise, I said to her one day, you know, there was some policy thing, some policy went through, and I said, look, uh, this, this didn't come through me, well, you know, how come? She said, you, you economic advisors have nothing to do with policy. They compile the industrial policy, in, index of industrial production, the wholesale price index, and things like that. So then I said to them, why don't you find another economic advisor? Uh, thank you very much. Then, actually, uh, she started using much more. And then, of course, we became very close and the best of friends, because she was much older than I am. Um, and so uh, that's how I entered the, industrial, the Ministry of Industry. So what I did through the research, um, the result of my research was a comprehensive paper co-authored with my colleague Vandana Agarwal, who was then a young uh, senior research officer from Indian Economic Service. She has recently retired as economic advisor uh, in the Ministry of Civil Aviation. But that paper provided it was a comprehensive understanding of, uh, the, of, of the origin of the Indian economic control system, on which I'll say a little more. Um, the paper is called Commands and Controls, Planning for Industrial Development, 1951 to 90, and came out of the Journal of Comparative Economics. So let me give a brief uh, overview of how the system operated by the late 1980s. Um, so we, you, many of you won't be familiar with the term license permit Raj. That is, you couldn't do anything without a license or a permit 
And Raj, of course, comes from the British colonial system, we call the Raj, British Raj. So this was some of the system of licenses and permits which governed everything. So the prior to the sweeping industrial policy of 1991, the industrial, the establishment and operation of an individual industrial enterprise in India required approval from the central government at almost every step. So this illustrates what you had to do. Uh, I'll quickly, I won't repeat stuff, but to get an idea. So if you wanted to set up uh, an industry, you first went to the Ministry of Industry and got a in principle so-called letter of intent, LOI, uh, which usually required that you can do this if you also set up what are called phase manufacturing program, which said that in the first year, you can import 90% of your intermediate input, second year, only 60% and so on. So you can quote indigenize uh, the intermediate inputs you're going to get. And that process was then related to what import license you would get. So after armed with the LOI, the entrepreneur could then type other requirements to set on the project. The import of capital goods to machinery to set up the project, they would have to go to the chief controller of imports and exports. The title is a terrific chief controller of imports and exports in the Ministry of Commerce or Ministry of Trade. But it's also interesting. It'll, the the, the uh, license was given by the chief controller of imports and exports in uh, Ministry of Commerce, but the approval is given by a committee set up in the Ministry of Industry. Okay, and most industrial projects, of course, then needed foreign technology, so for that you then have to go back to the Ministry of Industry, get what is called a foreign collaboration agreement, and that the Ministry of Industry would then say you can give this kind of royalty so much percent, not so much, etc. Um, the foreign collaboration agreement or this foreign technology agreement um, was serviced by the Ministry of Industry, but chaired by the Secretary of Ministry of Finance um, because it involved output of foreign exchange when you would give the royalties. Um, and once you got that, you could then get permission allocation of foreign exchange from the Reserve Bank of India. Okay, then if you wanted to raise domestic funds, the project which you normally used to have to do, you'd go back to what is called the controller of capital issues in the Ministry of Finance. And so you're going to have to separate approval from the control of capital issues for imports of raw materials. First, you got the permission to get permits to get capital goods, but then to run the industry, you need imports uh, for raw material components. Separate licenses were needed on an annual basis from the Chief control imports and exports. And the list actually was decided by the Ministry of Industry as part of phase manufacturing program because they said you can only in the first year you can import this, second you can import this, third year, et cetera, et cetera. So the import licenses you got were uh, from those lists. And in each case, for before giving the permission, the Ministry of Industry had something called the Director General for Technical Development um, and the so called technical wing of the Industry Ministry. Um, before giving the approval for getting an import, they had a called an indigenous non-availability clearance. So that is to say that if you wanted to import screws, I mean, that's being uh, trivial, but more screws, they had to first find out if someone in India was producing them. If they were, then you wouldn't get the import license. So mm. once everything was tied up, the unit was about to go to production, the entrepreneur had to go back to the Ministry of Industry to turn the letter of intent to industrial license. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, and after that, then approach the government owned development finance institutions to get financing. So that was the process which is summarized here. Now, what is interesting is people call, I, I say, I was saying to Shruti yesterday that by non -th unthinking current economist friends call this India's socialist development program. It didn't anything but socialism. As I did the research for the commands control paper, I found that almost, e almost each of these controls was actually inherited from the Second World War, which had a Defense of India Act, which was promulgated in 1939. Comprehensive economic controls were put in through in motion through issuance of rules 81, I'm just giving detail, rules 81 and 84 in the Defense of India Act. 
of the Defense of India rules. Rule 81 had a blanket provision for regulating or prohibiting the production, treatment, keeping, storage, employment, transport, distribution, disposable dis uh, acquisition, use or consumption of articles or things of any description whatsoever. So this, by the way, you has had a similar act here at, in, during the Second World War. Uh, so, and this is how a lot of this stuff started, also here, the UK and so on. Um, under Rule 84 of the central government also empowered to prohibit or restrict import or export of all kinds and to control the purchase of foreign exchange and to make restrictions on payments, etc. These powers were later enshrined immediately after independence 1947 in a flurry of specific legislative enactments soon after independence, as I said, the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act, Imports and Export Controls Act, the Capital Issues, Continuance of Controls Act, and a little later, the Industry, De Industry Development Regulation Act in 1951, or 51, if I remember correctly. So these main instruments, what you've listed here, were really extensions of the Defense of India powers acquired by the government during the Second World War. Um, and they served as the administrative arrangements designed to implement thinking on national policy, which had been earlier expressed in the Statement on National Policy in 1945, Industrial Policy Resolution 1948, and then later on after independence, the 1956 Industrial Policy Resolution. And with some, in terms of general relevance of all this, whenever government does something, you, particularly if it's negative, it lasts for a long time. And then people forget where it came from. This panoply of control, as I said, has usually been seen to result from socialism and the practice of planning in India. But my view is that it is important to understand that first, the economic and industrial control system was put in place before planning started in 1952. Second, as I said, the system of the war powers in 1939. Um, given these origins, the system was much more for control and less for socialism and development. And if I may say so, this was consistent with the colonial bureaucratic mindset designed to control rather than to foster development, a system that we inherited and to some extent have not changed to this date. Uh, if we just think about it, in, in, the, in, in the colonial uh, bureaucracy, the main, first of all, it is incredible how few people from Britain controlled such a huge country in India. Incredible, actually. So the main aim was, was really just to keep peace and control. That was, you can't blame them. That was their objective. The objective wasn't to develop India uh, or anywhere else. So that control mindset in the bureaucracy just continued. So uh, as if these controls were not enough, uh, now, these are our own inventions. This I can't blame the Defense of India Act. Okay? New forms of control were added over the years. Uh, there had traditionally been great concern in India with the concentration of economic power. As a result, the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act was promulgated in 1969. Under this act, companies with assets over some specified limit had to pin, in addition to all those permits I mentioned, they had to go a specific separate clearance from then established MRTP commission. Uh, moreover, such companies could invest in only a specified set of industries, other than they are not allowed to invest. Um, also, the foreign direct investment was only also permit up to a limit of 40% equity in that same list of industries where large firms are allowed to invest. Further, uh, we had a, a inclination to promote small-scale industries as an objective of Indian planning, some extent uh, narrated from the Gandhian view uh, of how the country should develop, um, it was assumed that most consumer goods, that is, again, anything you buy in Walmart uh, now, uh, were produced in low technology, um, which was labor, uh, it was assumed this was labor using and exhibit constant returns to scale. Therefore, you could promote manufacturing employment by confining the production of such items to small scale enterprises and thereby disallowing the production of large manufacturing units. The list of such items expanded significantly during the 
Murarji Desai, Prime Minister, led Janata government in 1977 to 1980, when the left-leaning George Fernandez, uh, who was a social, who, he was a socialist firebrand, he'd been trade union leader, etc. He led the only, I think, countrywide railway strike that we've ever had. Um, and 836 items were reserved for small scale enterprises. And if you go around Walmart, you'll find all those items. Okay. And that's why I don't find India there, because we've had this tradition of producing them small scale. And so neither do they have marketing capacity nor technical capacity, etc. cetera. Um, so almost all consumer goods items which were led, led the East Asian manufacturing push in the 60s, 70s, 1980s, such as clothing of all kinds, shoes, toys, hand tools, dinnerware, cutlery, stationery, and the like, tables, chairs, uh, were included in this list. So Indian manufacturing was therefore rendered uncompetitive in world markets by policy, although we didn't realize that. And ironically, manufacturing employment growth was severely stunted. It's the opposite of what was intended. Again, you know, you have to think about when you do economic policy, what can be unintended consequences of what you do? Uh, so by the mid-1990s, while India had fewer than 10 million organized manufacturing sector workers, remember our population now is 1.4 billion. And uh, by the way, the organized sector industrial manufacturing employment has not gone up much more than 14 or 15 million, if that. Um, in the mid-90s, China had more than 100 million in similar organized sector manufacturing activities. From 1977, again, you know, we experts at, at uh, doing ourselves in, 1977, there was also a ban on the location of industries in the 20 to 30 largest cities. In 1988, this ban was extended to include municipal areas of all towns and cities and the specific areas of influence around the 21 largest cities that you couldn't put manufacturing for 50 miles for the largest cities. So this was among the most irrational policy adopted, bordering on the bizarre. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, industrialization and urbanization have gone hand in hand. By prohibiting the location of industries in urban areas, they were deprived of productivity gains that uh, arise from agglomeration economies, and towns and cities were deprived of the energy and entrepreneurship the industries bring with them. So, you know, even New York had lots of manufacturing. Uh, in the presence of such a Byzantine system of industrial and trade controls, it is a miracle that industry, Indian industry grew at all over the long period of 40 years since 1950. In fact, Indian industrial growth averaged in real terms about 6% per annum over 40 years, 1950 to 1990, and over 7.5% from 1950 to 65, and during the 80s, the low time between 65 to 1980. In the beginning, as savings investment rates went up, along with large public sector enterprise investments, the common system, therefore, was quite successful in achieving industrial growth. The failure of Indian economic policy, in my view, was that it did not adapt itself to the overall economy becoming more complex and the rapidly changing international environment after a relatively stable international period of 50s and 60s. It is very difficult to understand why such a system persisted over this long period, uh, while much of the rest of the world had moved on, especially our neighbors in East and Southeast Asia. What is interesting is that even by the early 1960s, it was well understood within the government that this system was ill-suited for directing investments through planning. Accordingly, in the 1960s, the government appointed one committee after another, which, is, which are listed here, uh, to examine the industrializing system. 1964, 1964, 1965, 1967, 1969, 1969. The industrializing thing and policy inquiry committee, uh, 1969, had firmly concluded that the system had failed practically in all counts. Not my words, their words. Uh, whether it was regional dispersal, import substitution, preventing concentration of economic power, enforcement of licensing conditions, or even implementing planning priorities. Even with the, the puzzle to be is, which I don't have an answer, even with such damning indictments, these committees would typically conclude that despite its defects, the industrializing system was useful and should continue. There was a persistent reluctance to learn from experience and to change course. 
it would be easy to ascribe this impermeability of the system to vested interest, rent seeking, etc. Of course, bureaucrats and politicians gain to the vast discretionary powers that the system grants them, in addition to opportunities for corruption. Bigger incumbent industrialists gain because of the advantage of the preferential access they enjoy. Uh, or perhaps it was the structure of the Indian administrative service that explains this persistence. So what, as I said before, what came naturally to them was control rather than development. But inexplicably, and this is also interesting for this audience, much of informed academic opinion also continued, continued allegiance to the system. Uh, finally, the deregulation gained from support in the 1980s, more in the bureaucracy, interestingly, than in academy. Apart from the seminal work of Professor Jagdej Bhagwati and his wife, Padma Desai, who recently passed away, Professor Bhagwati was teacher now at Columbia, uh, much of academic opinion still supported the control system underpinning the ideals of planned economic development. So the fig leaf of planned development, licensing thing and controls remained for a long time. That the emperor had no clothes was too painful for the system to acknowledge. So we come back to our reforms. So such was the situation at the beginning of 1980s when Indira Gandhi returned to power as prime minister. Stagnation industrial growth since the mid 60s was most during her time. Uh, had started being um, obvious. So political perception of the need to act gathered some force, not a great deal, but some force. She laid the groundwork of tentative economic policy reforms towards deregulation by appointing a succession of committees headed by noted, noted technocrat civil servants, a number of committees that came in the 1980s. And that's what I meant, I said in the beginning, that on this issue, there was a gathering degree of technocratic consensus and these reforms were homegrown in that sense. So uh, the reports of these committees were in the direction of some liberalization, however tentative. Similarly, we had something called the Bureau of Industrial Costs and Prices, which had hitherto acted as the czar of administered industrial prices, ranging from steel to cement, copper, pharmaceuticals and all manner of intermediate inputs. That is, uh, the Bureau of Initial Costs and Prices um, examined the accounts of many companies and they would say, you can only sell cement at this price, you can only sell steel at this price, you can sell copper at this price. All the drug prices were controlled by them and so on. Um, and that was in addition to all the other things that I've talked about. What was interesting is that um, they began to change tack in the 1980s under the successive leadership of another set of modernizing civil servant technocrats, uh, Neem Zim won't mean much to you, Lavraj Kumar, I had mentioned Yugendra Alag before, and Vijay Kelkar, who was a PhD in economics from Berkeley, and he'd been in the government in different positions, and Inquiry Planning Commission. So a succession of reports on steel, cement, aluminum, etc. ensued, each of which recommended price regulation of some, some, some price deregulation. And I think perhaps the success of East Asian economies had finally made the government more receptive to these recommendations. So let me come back to my story and being self-indulgent. So I came to the Ministry of Industry as economic advisor in December 1988, full of enthusiasm to work in national policy reform. As I said, I first had uh, difficulty with my boss, but then it's changed. I busied myself with research, as I mentioned before. But then, um, just when the Rajiv Gandhi government was on its last legs in 1989, yeah, 1989 um, you know, the whole bureaucracy is headed by the top civil servant, what was the cabinet secretary. He presides the whole government as, as a bureaucratic level. So there was a man called T. N. Session, S. E. S. H. A. N., who came as a cabinet secretary. He was a real activist. And I think that the post of cabinet secretary is actually very inactive in the sense you basically sit all day, heading committees, you don't do very much. I mean, of course, you you know, really you just sit, you, the man is poor fellow is com, confined to the cabinet secretary's office. So he was, this was too inactive for him. So he started a flurry of activity for, in the government. Um, so he asked all the major departments to prepare detailed presentations on their current and future activities. You know, uh, most fruitless things were given by the bureaucrats, uh, like our friend here, Karthik, uh, two economic advisors. You, you know, 
So being uh, so being seen as fruitless activity by the industry ministry, the senior mandarins, uh, such thankless tasks, as I said, were uh, thrust on people like me, the economic advisors, so they could continue happily with the license permit activity uh, while we were busy doing you know, all this useless stuff. So I had to prepare the ministry's presentation for Mr. Session. So the question I had to answer was, what is India's industrial policy? This was not easy, given the complexity. What I've now, now it's easy to say, whatever, but if you think that you're sitting in the government, it's not no one, anyone has put together all this stuff, right? So given the complexity, uh, this is also the complexity had increased because the Rajiv Gandhi government in the after 85 had done some piecemeal reforms, uh, rising from these committees, okay? So the complexity increased even more because something was liberalized, something was not liberalized to understand what you can do, what you can't do was more complex. So the process of compiling and collating all the existing industrializing policies was in retrospect, the first step that led to the industrial policy from 1991. You have to first know what the hell you have to reform, right? Um, so this was the first time they said that the many different licensing and control mechanisms that existed could be seen in one place. However, not much came of this exercise since the Rajiv Gandhi ministry unraveled towards the late 1989, new elections were called, and the Congress power, Congress party lost power, as did Mr. Session. So that was useless. The new government, the new prime minister was Mr. V.P. Singh, who had actually worked as Rajiv Gandhi's finance minister, but then had broken with him, and then he became prime minister of the opposition party. So the, the non-Congress government that came in 1989, uh, December 1989, wanted to differentiate itself from the Congress history of license permit Raj. As finance minister Rajiv Gandhi's government, Mr. Singh had acquired a reputation for being a liberal reformer in the context of those days. So there was renewed expectation of liberalizing economic reforms. Um, he appointed Mr. Ajit Singh, who was the son of the former Prime Minister Charan Singh, uh, but relative, Mr. Ajit Singh was very well known. He was a farmer's leader, etc. Uh, though Ajit Singh, relatively unknown, as I said, was a point new industry minister, he was also a breath of fresh air. When I say this, people in India will say, "What are you talking about?" You know, because while his later reputation was sullied by repeatedly and opportunistically changing parties and coalitions all the time, uh, he was then at that time he was seen as a smart techie. So in fact, I mean, he probably was a member of almost every government that came in because he just kept, in, kept switching parties. And because he had a political base, um, he could do that. So his education at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, which is the first in IIT, and at the Illinois Institute of Technology uh, here. And then also he worked for IBM in the US. Uh, had made him instinctively critical of the then license permit Raj. When the new government came, reshuffle of secretaries, and Mr. Amarnath Verma, the Commerce, then Commerce Secretary, at that time succeeded Otima Bodia, who had mentioned before as the industry secretary. He had spent a number of years in the SCAP secretariat in Bangkok. So he had become very familiar with what happened in East Asia, economic miracle. So what happens whenever a new minister comes, the civil servants make a presentation describing the ministry and the work content. With Verma being new himself, this new thankless task again fell on me. I didn't tell anyone, but I said in no time, of course, I dug out my presentation prepared earlier. For Mr. Session, impressing Mr. Verma, my boss, no end, that I was so quick. Uh, so, living up to the uh, image of technocratic modern man, Mr. Ajit Singh's reaction when I made the presentation was something to the something like, What is all this nonsense? How can we function this way in this country? And we were tasked to prepare an agenda for industrial reforms. This was 1990. Now, the lightning rod was the annual World Economic Forum. Uh, summit in Davos in January 1990, um, where developing countries eager to attract global attention and capital display their wares to the assembled collectivity of Davos man. Ajit Singh was uh, nominated by the Prime Minister to lead the Indian contingent. So once again, a presentation had been prepared, this time for the minister, including a pitch for liberalization of foreign direct investment. So he would then present that to Davos man. I now went further in proposing changes to what I already had that could possibly pass muster with the powers that be, which could be put forward in an elite international setting. So those were busy weeks before end January in the Davos meeting. Uh, 
with frequent meetings between the minister, the secretary of industry, and myself as he prepared for his trip. And so in some sense, this was the second stage of preparation of internal policy reforms of 1991, what became later. Unfortunately, this effort also came to naught because at the last minute, the Prime Minister VP Singh, for some political reason, ditched Mr. Ajit Singh to lead the delegation to Davos. He continued the industrial minister and inexplicably nominated the last minute RF Mohammad Khan, who is currently governor of Kerala and now in the BJP, um, and, the, uh, and asked him to lead. He was then Minister of Civil Aviation and Energy, asked him to lead the delegation. Uh, the funny thing was that the, it was a very powerful bureaucratic delegation of A.N. Verma, Montek Singh Alawalia, Secretary, Prime Minister's Office, Nitin Desai, the then Chief, Chief, Chief Economic Advisor, with me carrying the bags. Of course, uh, not physically because I'm too small to do that. Um, since Arif had no background, uh, so, so when, it's actually it was soon, we went one day earlier before the Prime Minister, uh, so before the Industrial Minister was supposed to reach. It's only when we reached uh, Basel, uh, um, Zurich, the Indian ambassador who received us said, your minister is not coming. So what happened? He said, well, Mr. Arif Mohammed Khan is coming. So, okay. so uh, Arif had no background. There'd be no time for a briefing. There could be no productive presentation in the meeting. So the trip ended up being a fiasco. And Mr. Arif Mohammed Khan, I guess he's, he's still alive, so I shouldn't say it, but I will, spent most of his time doing shopping. Uh, in Davos. Uh, how he got the foreign exchange at that time, I don't know, because foreign exchange was all completely restricted. Uh, the funny thing was, whenever Indian ministers have a special assistant, again, member of the bureaucracy, who accompanies them anywhere they go. So because the speech was made at the last minute, Mr. Ajit Singh's special assistant who got his visa and so on, there was no time for Mr. Arif's special assistant to get the visa to go to Switzerland. So Mr. Ajit Singh especially went with Mr. Arif uh, to Davos. So it was his special assistant uh, who gave me all the information what Mr. Arif Muhammad Khan was up to uh, during visit to Davos. However, this experience did not deter Ajit Singh from continuing with the work preparing the new national reform blueprint. And it can, under the continued leadership of A.N. Verma, we prepared a detailed comprehensive framework for a very significant departure for Indian industrial policy for after almost four decades. Much of the difficulty in pushing reform was within the government. The cabinet consisted of a motley group of leaders assembled in an unwieldy coalition. The finance minister, Madhu Dandavate, was an old socialist, and his senior staff consisted of Bimal Jalal, who later became governor of the Reserve Bank, who hired me as deputy governor in the Reserve Bank, as finance secretary, and Nitin Desai as the chief economic advisor. Um, as we sought the prime minister's approval, in, in principle, to go ahead with the liberalizing industrial policy, he asked Ajit Singh to forge a consensus uh, with the other main economic ministries, particularly the finance ministry. So there was a high level meeting with the finance minister, the industry minister, um, at which we have said what we wanted to say. And basically, they didn't agree. And I was trying to speak up. So my close friend, Nitin Desai, who was chief economic advisor, he later became the UK Under Secretary General of the UN and a very, very, very close friend. Um, at one point, he got so frustrated, he said, shut up now, Rakesh, uh, in front of all the ministers and everyone present. And after the meeting, Dimal Jalan, again, who is one of my most respected uh, people, we again became very, very close later. As I said, he hired me. He rang up A.N. Varma, the secretary, never bring this fellow again to a meeting, you know. So the, those were the days. Uh, so, but our hard work did result in something concrete, though much diluted a relatively comprehensive policy statement, clumsily titled, Policy Measures for the Promotion of Small-Scale and Agro-Based Industries, that was to satisfy that particular lobby, and Changes in Procedures for Industrial Approvals, the name, whole name of the policy document. This long-forgotten policy made it past the cabinet and was formally announced by Ajit Singh in parliament on May 31, 1990. So this was the third stage of the preparation of 1991 national policy reforms. Almost everyone has forgotten, but that document even was formally placed in Parliament. And the only place that I know that you can find the draft of that, the actual policy document, is in an annex, an appendix to Arvind Panagaria's book, uh, India, the Emerging Giant, 2008 book, where he has an appendix of that particular policy. So 
so, but then there was a I, something I have to mention. Uh, so, among uh, among other ideas, it proposed that various licensing requirements be withdrawn for certain certain sets of port priority industries. Similarly, it was proposed a major departure in liberalizing foreign direct investment, once again in a specified list of industries. The major doc drawback of the document, which I drafted uh, and I admit was a major drawback, was a lack of clarity of what those lists of industries would be, which would be notified later. So then there was a comical uh, bureaucratic interlude, uh, which I guess no one else would know, which effectively buried uh, the policy even before it got into political difficulty. So as part of the modernization effort, I had attempted to make the, the, in, the in, old industry list in National Policy 1956 and so on, and, and the Act of 1952 had very antiquated uh, uh, classification of the industry, which remained all through. Uh, there's a globally accepted harmonized system of international trade classification, ITCHS. So I, among the modernization effort, um, I uh, uh, I was attempting to make those lists into this new list. Um, so um, um, as we labored to make these lists in the new classification, we prepared documents to be taken to the committee of secretaries then headed by the then cabinet secretary, someone called V.C. Pandey for approval. As luck would have it, unfortunately, the first ent entry in the ITC agents classification happens to be live horses, asses, mules, and hinnies, and horses. So as the document opened at the meeting, Pandey's eyes fell into unfortunate lines, and he exploded exclaiming, exclaiming in Hindi, uh, there are very few people understand Hindi, but I'll still say, so he said, yahan ki ke ghode, gadhe, khachar, <laughs> in liye aay, industrial policy mein. That is, he said, have you assembled here to discuss horses, asses, and mules? And the industrial policy statement modernizing that policy. The mirth, of course, that ensued among the assembled group of, I would say, door faced secretaries of economic ministries sitting in the rarefied confines of the cabinet room can only be imagined. The curmudgeonly VC Pandey led the charge and have unceremoniously hustled out of the room to my great and lasting embarrassment. Thus ended the life of the stillborn 1990 industrial policy statement. But this was fortunate because the eventual 91 policy state was much better, much more comprehensive and radical. In any case, several political forces, in, starting with Mr. Chandrasekhar's rebellion, ostensibly of the industrial policy combined to bring down the VP Singh government on November 10, 1990, November 10, 1990, and Mr. Chandrasekhar, an old politician, finally realized his dream to become the prime minister. As a leader behind the opposition to industrial reforms, industrial policy reforms, Prime Minister Chandrasekhar chose to retain the industrial policy portfolio. He became the industrial minister along with being prime minister. Um, um, so he, he, he said, I want you to, uh, so, so he came industrial minister, he came himself to industry ministry building as prime minister. He says, he came and spoke to us and he said, um, I have become an industry minister because I disagree with what you had done. However, I want you to know that I want you to keep giving me the best impartial advice of whatever you think is correct. Don't worry about what I said in the past few months. So this is what we did. Uh, but within a few months, by mid-March 91, Chandrasekhar's Rump administration collapsed and elections were called. The final, this finally brings me shares to the industrial policy reform of 1991. So the new industrial, so the new Congress government got elected with P.V. Narasimha Rao as the prime minister. He retained many of the faces of the outgoing regime, but perhaps the greatest consequence was his decision to select Amarnath Verma somehow as his principal secretary. The Indian prime minister has a principal secretary uh, who is very, always a very senior most uh, bureaucrat. So this made Verma the prime minister's personal enforcer and the most powerful bureaucrat, along with then cabinet secretary Naresh Chandra. Narsim Rao, like Chandra Shekhar, chose to retain the industry portfolio, which again is an incredible thing. And some sense, that was, I would say Chandra Shekhar's role in that having opposed policy reforms, he became industry minister. So his successor also decided to become industry minister. I don't know whether uh, this was because the new principal secretary, Verma, influenced Rao. I, wouldn't, I have no idea. Uh, 
because I, I can certainly say that if we had an industry minister, we could never have done these reforms because no industry minister would want to let go of all the controls and power that he would have. In any case, uh, that one of the authors by the anti industrial policy reforms landed at the Prime Minister's office. The Prime Minister chose to retain the industrial portfolio, turned out to be an incredible coincidence. Along with Verma, he also chose to direct uh, Jaram Ramesh uh, in the Prime Minister's office, who also in, who had also been involved. And when, in view of the grave economic crisis, he appointed Dr. Manmohan Singh as the finance minister. So Manmohan Singh immediately called a meeting of the secretaries of all the major economic ministries as soon as he first or second day of the finance minister. Uh, I was the only non-secretary present as the new industry secretary after A.N. Verma was someone called Suresh Mathur. He said, you know about all this. I don't know anything because I'm new. You come with me. So Manmohan Singh outlined the full economic reform program that was to be followed in the next five years in 10 minutes. And more importantly, a detailed thing on the next six weeks. The latter included immediate action to be taken on industrial policy. He said quite clearly they had the full mandate of the prime minister to do whatever had to be done um, to solve the crisis and to put India on a self-sustained medium and long-term growth path. Since he knew that some of the mandarins present were not on board with the kind of reforms proposed, he said, if any of you have any difficulty with the proposed reform program, we can find other things for you to do. So this was perhaps the most firm and forceful that I ever saw Dr. Manmohan Singh to be. Um, he knew of the, our document uh, because he'd been cabinet uh, economic advisor at cabinet level to Chandrasekhar. And, and he'd known me for a long time. He knew I'd done it. So he called me personally. He said, uh, I hear you have an initial policy document. Could you, can I see it? So, of course, I trotted off to the cabinet secretariat where his office was with alacrity. And of course, in those days, hard copy, there's no internet, nothing. So gave him the hard copy. So he knew this thing existed. Um, so after the horses, asses, and mules fiasco of June 1990, um, uh, we had continued our work. Uh, we had filled the blacks, blanks and prepared the whole lists. And we retained the original classification so that things would not, horses would not come into action again. Uh, with the finance minister having clear direction, a steering committee economic reforms was created in the PMO, Prime Minister's Office under Mr. Ayan Verma. It's also very unusual. And he held a meeting every Thursday, every week for five years to push all the reforms. And of course, so um, the main difficulties ironically came from the finance ministry officials. I can name them, Mr. S.P. Shukla, who's finance secretary, and Deepak Nambayar, a chief economic advisor, who were holdovers from Chandrasekhar's government. They had honest and principled differences in views and did not hesitate to express them. The discussions were held greatly by the support of Jaram Ramesh on one side, Monte Alwalia, and meetings. So this will continue. Um, it was decided the industrial policy would pres be presented along with the budget on July 24, 1991. Um, however, uh, the cabinet, new cabinet, had to approve it on July 1991. It was both presented on five days later. Uh, unfortunately, um, no, they didn't approve it. Um, they they were un, they were they were not willing to be so quote revolutionary in 1991. The years Rotary had actually they felt that the years was being people were being disowned. So they felt that Jawaharlal Nehru Indira Gandhi this Congress government was being uh, repudiated. So the note did not pass the cabinet. Instead, a group of ministers was set up to look into the policy proposals again. And it met on the evening of July 20 to discuss an amended, somewhat toned down cabinet note, but we had actually not changed any language in the actual substance. Um, so this was this again did not assuage the other side. Uh, and much of the opposition came from old guard Gandhi family loyalists like ML Potidar and Arjun Singh, and the meeting broke up without a decision. It was felt the political packaging of reforms was not right. Instead of tinkering with the policy proposals again, a long preamble to the cabinet tour was then prepared, authored by the deft hands of wordsmiths, Jairam Ramesh and Commerce Minister P. Chidambaram, who later became Finance Minister, uh, in concert with Manmohan Singh, uh, just did a preamble, uh, which stressed continued and change in the policy reforms proposed. It stressed that all interests were being taken care of and mentioned the successive contributions of Prime Minister Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, to national policy over the years, and how this document was in the same tradition. Not a word was changed 
not a word was changed, a substantive part of the document, which had failed to pass much earlier. The new uh, preamble did the trick, and the cabinet gave its approval to title policy reforms on July 23. Uh, and the Congress Working Committee, the Congress Party has a top uh, committee of their own. Uh, uh, the Congress Working Committee followed suit the same afternoon, and um, um, it got approved. And, and we, before we thought that it'll get changed, we said we better put it tomorrow, uh, the day after the, 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 the day after the, the decision. So we did that. I'll give a last point before I conclude. So, uh, also on a personal level, so having learned the horses, irises, and mules lesson. This time I had retreated to the original antiquated classification of industries in the different lists embodied in the policy document. These lists were later on notified in the ITC modern HS classification. The only discussion that took place around midnight in the room of the cabinet secretary, Naresh Chandra, was whether the industry lists appended to the policy statements should be called annexes or annexures. This is my contribution again, by the way. I've been combing dictionaries to find the word annexure, which is used in all Indian documents till today. Uh, so I insisted to the cabinet secretary in the middle of the night that the word annexure did not exist in any dictionary that I could find. So uh, a search was then uh, made in the cabinet secretary's office to find different dictionaries at midnight. <laughs> um, and uh, I had my little victory. So among other innovations, the biggest innovation in industrial policy in 1991 is the use of a term annex and not annexure. Yeah. Um, the next day at 12.50 p.m. on July 24, 1991, quite unceremoniously, a reluctant P.J. Kurian, who was the Minister of State, we have cabinet minister under him, the Minister of State, stood up and looked Sabha and just tabled the new industrial policy, ushering in a new uh, India along with Finance Minister Manmohan Singh, who gave a path-breaking budget the same day at 5 p.m. Um, the, oh, I always thank you. So, um, so this is the content uh, of all the reforms. We abolished international licensing to a great deal. Some still remained. Foreign investment was significantly liberalized, but liberalized much more later. Foreign technology agreements were made automatic, except for some limits. And there were a number of industries that had also been reserved for only public sector. And that release was proved tremendously. The MRTP Act was abolished. And then I also mentioned the, the MRTP Act, which defined large companies, had a limit of assets at any given time on all the large companies in the definition. So um, we had, uh, you know, we wanted to abolish it. But we didn't, as technocrats, have the courage to go to the minister and say, look, abolish this. So we saw a large number, like um, uh, 1,000 crores would be how many million? Um, 10,000, 10, 10 billion. Um, so the minister at that time, uh, with that particular ministry, was someone called Kumara Mangalam. And so I went to him and he says, what's the rationale behind this 10 billion? I said, there's no rationale. Um, so then why do we abolish it? I said, very good, thank you very much, and that we abolish it. So I'll uh, stop here. Uh, sorry for straining your patience, but thank you very much for listening to me. As you can see, I've had a good time preparing this and talking to you.